Welcome to Heavy Networking, the flagship podcast from the Packet Pushers. I am Ethan Banks. Connect with me on LinkedIn, where I post content to help you keep up with what's going on in IT, especially networking. And with me today is Yvonne Pepelniak. You should be following Yvonne via IPSpace.net. And if you aren't following IPSpace.net, take a minute and do it now. You will be connected to Yvonne's 30 plus years of industry experience, thousands of articles, literally thousands, in deep technical instruction, as well as what he offers to the networking community in the form of our topic today. That is the labbing tool, NetLab and spinoff project BGP Labs. Yvonne, welcome back to Heavy Networking. You have generously shared your time with this podcast many times before. And folks, if you're new to Heavy Networking, you got to go back into the archives. Yvonne's there a lot. But uh, Yvonne, it's uh, it's great to chat with you again. And uh, may maybe we start today's conversation with a very simple question, which is, why NetLab? A uh, very simple answer, because labbing networking stuff sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, it does. So so I'll tell you what I think you mean by that. You you correct me. But so for me, when I've used a bunch of different GUI based products before and I've used uh, um, uh, viral now CML from Cisco, I've used uh, GNS3 for a long time. Big fan of that one. I've used. Uh, oh, what's the other GUI one that came up in, uh, you know, it's kind of a competitor GNS3. I'm spacing out. Even Evengi, that's the one. Thank you. I've spent lots of time with all of those. And the setup time, Yvonne, that was it. The setup time to actually get the lab to the point where everything's addressed and all the links are built and all the devices are there so that I can actually do the thing I'm trying to simulate or test or figure out was just, oh, it drove me nuts. Yeah. Oh, you forgot you have to set up OSPF and BGP yeah. and yes. VXLAN and EVPN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it drove me nuts. It drove me so far that I stopped labbing because I just couldn't go through yet another set up the lab exercise. Okay, and so if, then, that's, if that's why NetLab then, then yeah, and then. So what is NetLab? What did you build? All right. Can I try to, uh, to win the buzzword bingo? Yes, please do. <laughs> it's an intent-based infrastructure as code, digital twins, Lifecycle management system. <laughs> I love it. You did. You do win. Yes, sir. You you may even get bonus points. Yeah, ten out of ten. Thank sir. you. <laughs> so, anyway, it's an orchestration system that takes a high level description of what you want to set up. First, it doesn't deal with devices and interfaces. It deals with nodes and links because honestly, a network is a graph. And then it does the IP address assignment for you. It calculates which interfaces have to be in which routing protocol. It does the VLAN assignment, VRF assignment, VXLAN network identifiers, BGP sessions, you know, all the boring stuff that you never wanted to configure, but you always had to. And when it figures out what it thinks you want, then it builds a configuration file for another lower level tool. And that could be VirtualBox, although I wouldn't recommend that. Or it could be libvirt with KVM on Linux, or it could be Container Lab. And uh, then it asks the other tool to spin up the lab. It might have to do a few tweaks, like for example, on Linux, the bridges that uh, libvirt creates do, do not pass LLDP through because that's the default yeah. setting on Linux. So, you know, the tool has to tweak the Linux bridges. And uh, if you want to use container lab with multi-access network, then the bridge has to be pre-created. So it does that. And if you want to combine containers and virtual machines in the same network, then someone has to connect them and the tool creates the bridges and then tells both. Well, so we're getting ahead of ourselves in some of the implementation details. So the NetLab is, it's, um, I was, as I was going through your documentation and watching a bunch of your videos on it, it felt like it's like a management plane for networking labs. Is that a fair analogy? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the umbrella orchestration system and until the lab is started. And then when the lab is started, the magic happens. Okay. Because, you know, I told you how the tool figures out what you need and the IP addresses and OSPF and BGP and all that. 
And we have templates that configure that on 20 different platforms. Yes. And so when the lab is up, the tool runs an Ansible playbook that configures all that, plus a number of other things on everything in your lab. And you're left with a lab that's up and running and routing protocols are up and IP addresses are up and VLANs are configured. And SRV6 is configured if you're of the SRV6 persuasion. <laughs> <laughs> so let me read this back to you then. When I install NetLab, I've now got an orchestrator for my lab, an orchestration tool for my lab. Uh, I need some underpinnings. I'm going to need things like yes. images. I'm going to need a virtualization environment. Uh, I'm going to need somewhere yeah. to actually run these images. Uh, NetLab, you've created enough uh, awareness and done enough modeling and so on that it will talk to a variety of virtualization platforms and then images that are running inside of those virtualization platforms to actually build the lab for me that I have described in uh, their YAML files, right? Yes. Okay. I told you it's infrastructure as code. Yeah. So yes, yeah, the lab yeah, yeah. is described in a YAML file, which, by the way, gives you the ability to put it under Git so you know what you have changed and why your lab is not working today. So what I can do with this then, you've, ju you've just described, and I'm going to read it back to you again. Uh, we, we can build a network topology. I've described this. There's going to be a, a, an addressing plan that's there. Um, uh, NetLab is an IPAM for me as well, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So in other words, I don't uh, have to think too hard about what my addressing scheme is going to be. It's just going to no, deal you, with it or? Yes. And configure it on the boxes and create the loopback interfaces and create all the other virtual interfaces like the VLAN interfaces and the VRFs and all that. All the tedious stuff, all the boring stuff. Yeah. So uh, on the IPM front, uh, it has built-in address pools that you can obviously modify. Everything is modifiable. So the, the whole tool is built around a huge YAML file of system defaults. And you can overwrite anything you wish. So you don't like the uh, addressing pool, create your own. Mm -hmm. You don't like the, the, how the loopback interfaces are addressed, create your own. You don't like how the that the VLAN, the first VLAN is VLAN 1000, change that. Mm -hmm. You don't like the first VXLAN identifier, change that. Be my guest. Everything is configurable. There are no hard-coded constants in the code. Okay. And then, you know, you define links. And the links could be point-to-point -point links or LAN, multi-access links. And when the NetLab gets to a point-to-point -point link, it takes the next subnet from the point-to-point -point pool. When it gets to the LAN link, it get, take, takes the next subnet from the LAN pool. Mm -hmm. We have the subnet. Next question is how to assign the IP addresses to nodes. And if the subnet is big enough, then every node has an ID, which is really just a sequence number. And it gets the same last octet on every subnet. So some router would be dot one on every subnet and some other router would be dot 42 on every subnet. That's a default I like. I can get behind that. Yep. Yeah. If the subnet is not big enough, then we go into sequential. And then however you uh, list the nodes attached to the link, they get the sequential addresses one, two, three, four, five. Unless obviously you're running HSRP or VRRP or any cast gateway. In which case you specify, well, the gateway address is dot one or dot minus one, which is the last one in the subnet. And then everything else is shifted accordingly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got IPAM. You're going to handle all that for me. It sounds like the way yes. the defaults behave are quite logical, pretty much how I'd be doing it by hand anyway. I don't see any immediate need. I'd be changing those have, defaults. You can like overwrite them. anything. Yeah. You want to change the identifier of the node on a subnet, you can do that. You want to specify a fixed IPv4 address for an interface or IPv6 address on an interface. It's totally dual stack. You can do that. You can say, I don't want this node to have an IP address. For example, it's a bridge and it's layer two. Going Attachment. back to buzzword bingo, if I was doing the digital twin thing, I could see why that might matter. In, uh, yes. in my, <laughs> tip, my typical lab scenario, which would be more instructor-based, like I'm trying to illustrate a principle or teach a concept, I, the addressing scheme isn't going to... Please automate nah, it. Just I don't matter. want to have to think about it. Yeah. Exactly. And that's how I set up my labs. 
Yeah. Now, another piece of this is uh, what we've got a dressing and that's all built. You're also going to stand up routing protocols for me and you, you yes. rattled off a bunch of acronyms. Let's walk through those in more detail. What, what routing protocols can NetLab deal with? Uh, well, the usual ones apart from RIP. So OSPF, so, uh, ISIS, OSPF, and BGP ISIS, at least? EIGRP, BGP. Oh, EIGRP as well. Okay. I yeah. could, I wouldn't have surprised me if you'd left that off, but I can see that. Okay. No, I mean, it's cheap. It's easier <laughs> than uh, OSPF or ISIS because it doesn't have areas. And I know there's even an implementation of it in, uh, in FRR. It's not just in Cisco code. I mean, that it's, it's didn't there, so. work when I tried it out. I wanted to have FRR supporting EIGRP, but at that time it didn't work. And then I never went back to it. Oh, I haven't looked at it for a bit. I know uh, I had spun it up and had it peering with something at one point and it was, it was working, but, um, oh, but nice. that, was, that, was, okay. that was quite a, ways, a while ago. So I might retry it. Yeah, it, it goes back. I don't know. He had an early implementation of it, Donald, uh, Don Sharp, um, but I don't know how deeply he got into it. It was a, it was a pet project of his. Yeah, I know it's in the FRR code. Uh, I spent like three seconds testing it. It didn't do what I thought it should be doing. I moved on. <laughs> okay. And that might be worth revisiting. Let's, let, let's be fair with Check my with level of effort there. <laughs> Check, with, <laughs> Check with Don and see if he's got that code to a point of maturity where it's worth your time. Yeah. Uh, okay. What about, uh, uh, I think BFD I saw on your list was another component you support? Absolutely. Yeah. So for OSPF, for example, uh, you define the default area for the box. And then if you don't do anything, the, the box is in that area. You can define an area per interface, so you get the usual uh, OSPF area stuff. You can define the cost. You can integrate BFD with OSPF, ISIS, and BGP. Uh, ISIS, the same thing. You define whether something is level one, level two, level one, two. Uh, you can define the NSAP. You can define the areas. BGP, obviously, is a little bit more complex. Yeah. With BGP, I really tried to simplify it as much as possible. So the very minimum you have to do is you just assign a BGP AS numbers to nodes. Okay. Because we have to know that. You can even specify the default AS number for the whole app, and then you just specify the exceptions. You can also define groups. So you can say this group has BGP AS number one, and the other group has BGP AS number two. Now, if two nodes with different AS numbers are attached to the same link. They automatically get an eBGP session between them. Sense. If two nodes are in the same AS number, then they automatically get an iBGP session between loopbacks. Unless you define uh, route reflectors in that autonomous system, in which case uh -huh. everyone gets a session with the route reflectors, but not, be not the full mesh. Right, yeah. So you're taking, again, all, the, all your defaults are the logical ones. You're, you're doing all the yes. things that you, you would expect. Yeah. And, and I'm going to assume overridable if you want, but yeah. I took a very hard stance that we will only support sane designs. Right. <laughs> Although with enough trickery and enough uh, weird settings, you can also set IBGP over EBGP in NetLab and run EVPN over IBGP over IPv4, which is propagated with EBGP because some people <laughs> still think that makes sense. <laughs> so we got all these routing protocols that are supported. Yeah. I have questions about data models, but we, we need to leave that. Um, then there's another thing here that I know that NetLab does, and uh, it was taken right off of one of your slides. It says, add network services. So what kind of network services are we talking about? Were they things like SNMP and NTP and this kind of that sort of thing or, or things like, well, um, we are slowly getting there. You, well, you, I think that eventually you will ask me about the roadmap and this is one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, I think it was more like the connectivity services like EVPN and MPLS VPN ah, right, and right, right. Okay. 6PE and all that. Something yes, over something yes. else. Makes stuff. sense. And there, and there were a bunch of those, right? That, yeah. Uh, that On started. the data plane, it's VLANs, VRFs, VXLAN, MPLS, MPLS VPN, uh, SR MPLS, and I think SRV6 on SR Linux or something. No one else bothered to implement it. <laughs> 
So I've got out of the gate, you're going to build me what what can be a rather robust and fully featured network out of the gate, and I don't have to spend a bunch of time tediously configuring it. And what's interesting here, there's a bunch of different network devices that you support this on, which means you've either taken advantage of some models that have been published or written your own models to abstract the details away and feed them into the, the multiplicity of network operating systems that you're supporting. Yeah, it's, our, it's all our own models because honestly, people, whoever is standardizing a model, uh, you know, focuses on their needs. And if it's IETF, we know it's the vendors. And if it's open config, we know it's the big guys like the Googles of the world. So none of the models met your needs as such? No, they are. On one hand, they are too complex. On the other hand, they don't have some stuff that I think I might need. So yeah, of course, I could go into augmenting them, but why bother? Yeah, gotcha. Uh, it would help, you know, if the vendors would actually implement those models consistently, because then I wouldn't have to create the device configurations. But as things stand, we just create our own data models that are as simple as we can get them. And then for every device, for every module, that configuration module that the device supports, there's a template that generates the snippets of the device configuration, like the IP, OSPF, blah, area, blah, on an interface. And then that gets pushed progressively to the devices to configure individual thingies that NetLab supports. So then for people that are thinking, Ivan, I want to model some crazy new esoteric BGP feature that just got baked in, uh, you know, it's, it's just been released in this NOS and your model doesn't support that. Do, can I can I tell NetLab somehow to do that via YAML somehow, or how could I implement yes. that? Well, uh, first uh, you can define your own attributes. So let's say that uh, you want to play with I don't know BGP DMZ bandwidth uh, community. That's the thing where you can specify how fast the links to other autonomous systems are for load balancing purposes. So you would say, I need a new attribute, which would be bgp.bandwidth. Mm -hmm. If you want to, you can just say, I have this attribute so that NetLab knows you didn't make a typo. Because, you know, you know that typos are the hardest things to find. So we try to validate everything. We don't assume that you want a new attribute. We assume that you made a typo, unless you define the attribute in advance. You will thank me later. I'm thinking you now. I, I think <laughs> like, yep, I like it. That makes sense. Anyway, so you define this new attribute and it would be on a link. So you say, I have a new link attribute, which is bgp.bandwidth. Now you can leave it at that or you can say, well, I want to validate that I don't uh, enter some stupid values because bandwidth cannot be cat. So you can say, well, this attribute has to be an integer. You can even specify it has to be an integer between zero and 10,000. Mm -hmm. And then NetLab would, um, would automatically validate what you're doing. So now you have this addition to the data model. And because it's defined as a link attribute, it gets copied into interfaces. And uh, now every device that can run BGP can inherit that attribute onto an interface. Now, someone has to configure some nerd knob, which is BGP bandwidth or BGP DMZ bandwidth or BGP blah, 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 something. Uh, for that, I can't do that, obviously, because I don't know what that nerd knob is. I can't do that for 20 devices. I'm not an AI. <laughs> and I don't want to get it wrong. So you have to do that. So what you do is you define the Jinja 2 templates that configure this one feature. Ah, okay. And then you say, well, on these devices, I want to have this extra template added to the list of things to be configured. And then once all the standard stuff is done and like the BGP neighbors are configured and your template is evaluated, executed, you get the extra commands to add and it gets pushed to the device. And now you have the fully configured lab. 
Or obviously you can do the other thing, the old fashioned way uh, where you set up the lab with BGP neighbors and no extra feature. And then you just SSH into the boxes and you configure them. Manually. Fire it up. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to do it that way, though. If it's all infrastructure as code, it's all infrastructure yes, as code. Yes, yes, yes. I want to be able to do it again. Uh, yes. typing is imperative. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. So there's a ton we can do with NetLab. And to me, you've solved I mean, the vast majority of anything I've ever thought about wanting to do in a lab and got frustrated by setting up lab. This is exactly what I wanted, Yvonne. You, you've, set, you've done Thank this. You. You've built the core stuff. The defaults are there pretty much as I would set them up. I haven't detected anything like, oh, I would have done that differently. Nope, it's pretty much how I would have done it. And I have the ability to put in extra stuff that you're not supporting yet because it's too esoteric or weird or whatever. You've given me the ability to uh, to stand that up as well. Well, what can't I do with NetLab? Are there some things that are impossible or like the wrong use case for NetLab? Hmm. I don't know. Well, one I mean, is RIP, I, right? You said, like, you're not going to support RIP. Now, that's just because who's well, using RIP and why uh, bother? Is that I, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I never, I did, I haven't done it yet. Okay. <laughs> so if, so there are uh, a number of ways you can extend NetLab. And uh, if you want to submit a pull request, you're most welcome. First, we cannot implement every feature and every configuration module on every device because everyone has finite time in their life. So if your device, the device that you're in, so let's say iOS XR. Mm -hmm. No one in their right mind wants to deal with iOS XR because that beast takes like three to five minutes to boot. Yeah, the the the, v, the virtual machine, yeah, the XR nine thousand yeah. V, whatever it is, yeah, that that thing, yeah. and it's a resource. I off. mean, uh, I, I have better uses for my time, but someone might want to say, well, I need VLANs on iOS XR. The data model is described. So what you are expected to configure is described. You have to create the configuration templates. Given the VLAN descriptions. Uh, do whatever needs to be done on iOS XR so that the VLANs are configured, for example. And then if you submit that uh, template in a pull request, we would all say thank you. One less thing to do, and it would be included and shipped in the next release. Okay. Next, you might want to have some nerd knobs which are not solvable just with the extra attributes. So, for example, one of the nerd knobs that I didn't want to put into the core BGP is, you know, those weird things where you have the same BGP AS number on two sides. Mm -hmm. You have two sides, they have the same AS number, but you honestly don't want the IBGP sessions between the sides. That's crazy. Because they are separate sides. Yep, yep. So someone has to go in and kill all those extra IBGP sessions so they are not configured. And I could just add a nerd knob to the BGP module, but then you know how that is. The nerd knobs keep exploding and the code keeps exploding and you can't test all the possible combinations of nerd knobs and you get Cisco software quality. <laughs> Now, another thing that's a technical limitation you were talking through in one of the videos I watched uh, getting ready for the show was the challenge of MLAG, uh, because LACP oh, yeah. doesn't, uh, those packets do not propagate through Linux bridges consistently. Yes. Yeah, MLAG is one of those things I don't want to touch. Yeah. So anyway, to solve this BGP thingy, you can always create a plugin. It's a loadable Python module that can have like 20 entry points that get called. It's all well-defined. It's all on the web. They get called at various points in the transformation process. So the first one is called before we even parse the defaults, then at the initialization time, then before the nodes are processed, then after the nodes are processed, then before the links are processed, then after the links are processed, yada, 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 yada. And then there's the final call if you want to have it. So... You can mod tweak and modify stuff so the, the in plugins... tons of different ways. You can insert yourself in yeah. the transformation process. Okay. 
So I could write a to deal with this BGP situation where I actually don't want to stand up the default behavior of uh, IBGP yeah. session. I could write a plugin, have mm -hmm. it get called at the right time during the stand up process. Of, well, of at, the, at and, the very end, because you have to kill some sessions, so you want the standard stuff to happen, and then you want to say, "Well, no, this shouldn't happen," and just remove some things. Okay. So I got, I got to get my hands dirty a little bit, but it's it's all doable. Mm -hmm. It's all doable yeah. is what you're saying. And yeah. then, for example, for RIP, this would be a full-blown configuration module like OSPF or ISIS or something like that, which is, yet again, it's a Python module. It's a mm -hmm. bit of a code that handles the stuff. And if I would do RIP, I would just copy OSPF and take a look at what the OSPF code is doing and then you know simplify that to deal with RIP. And then the hard part is uh, writing the configuration templates for various devices. And then the really hard part for some people is writing the documentation. <laughs> it always is. Writing docs is, uh, yeah. is, 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 you feel like you've done the job and documentation just feels like extra homework you don't want to do. Yeah, but you know what? If you invest your time into creating a, a configuration template for let's say VLANs on iOS XR. But then you forget to add the line to the documentation saying VLANs are now supported on iOS XR. How many people do you think will use them? I know, right? There's that. And uh, then there's also, I, I, I always say that documentation is the love letter you write to yourself because uh, if I don't document what I've done, especially if it was a complex process, like something uh -huh. I had to write in Python code, uh, I won't remember in six months when I need to modify that script exactly how it worked. And I'll waste a lot of time trying to parse through the code I wrote, but I can't remember how the stupid thing worked. If only I documented it and uh, writing that documentation is just so helpful. Yeah. Yeah. The hard things like some of the BGP stuff and some of the generic module stuff, because that gets really convoluted and particularly the VLAN stuff. If you look at the code, there is a comment on every line. But it's not the comment like, oh, we copy this to that because that's stupid. Yeah. I'm trying to tell the story on the right-hand side of the screen. Yes, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right. So I want to get started with NetLab. Uh, can you give me a base system recommendation? I think we were talking offline and you had said something like Ubuntu was a good Linux distro to use and you know, start with that. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. So theoretically, you could run some things on the virtual box on your Windows, maybe. Definitely on Mac. I was running stuff on Mac. But uh, honestly, I wouldn't do that. Uh, virtual box uh, ju ju just isn't at the same level as uh, KVM. So I would set up a Linux server, but it could also be a Linux virtual machine on your uh, laptop, for example. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Does it matter much bare metal versus a virtualized Ubuntu? No. Uh, well, the only thing, if you want to use containers, then it doesn't matter at all. If you want to use virtual machines, then you have to use nested virtualization. And nested virtualization is an interesting beast. VMware got it right years ago, and it all works. So if you're running uh, VMware Fusion or VMware Workstation and you run your Ubuntu box well, server on your Mac, Intel Mac, forget ARM Macs, or on your Windows laptop, it all works. If you think that you will run nested virtualization with VirtualBox, it's like, eh, maybe. <laughs> Depends on the CPU type and all that stuff. Personally, I'm using an uh, Intel NUC. Yeah. I bought one with, uh, I think, 8 or 16 cores. I put uh, 64 gig of memory in it because, you know, iOS XR and Nexus OS and a few other things. Yeah. <laughs> memory is more important than the number of cores, although with some things, the number of cores also matters. Then you put Ubuntu on it. And then you just have to install one Python package. And then NetLab includes the installation scripts to install everything else on Ubuntu. KVM and whatever else you might uh, need. KVM, Libvirt, uh, Ansible, uh, all the prerequisites for Ansible, Docker, Container Lab, everything. 
Then comes the interesting part. One quick question before we get yeah. to the, 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 the interesting question of images. Let's say I want to spin up Ubuntu on uh, Vulture or some kind of a virtual private server. Is that, that should work okay for me? Uh, absolutely. Well, yet again, nested virtualization. Right. So if you are okay with using Cumulus, Arista, FRR, or SR Linux, these four are available as pure containers. Mm -hmm. And there you don't need anything. You just need a Ubuntu instance anywhere. It could be Azure, it could be Google, it could be Oracle, it could be AWS, it could be any cloud provider that is offering you a Ubuntu instance. If you want to run the virtual machines, which would be iOS, iOS XE, Junos, you know, almost everything else, then you need nested virtualization, which I think might be working on Oracle Cloud, but I'm not sure. It should be working on Google Cloud. It's working on bare metal on AWS, but that gets ridiculously expensive. And I don't think Azure has anything, or at least didn't have when I last checked. For the smaller providers, I don't know. About Oracle specifically, they bought Ravello Systems a long time ago, and I don't know what that where that tech ended up, but in theory, that tech certainly could have made them capable of yeah. uh, nested virtualization. In the NetLab documentation, there is a pointer to a trick how to get nested virtualization running on Google Cloud. And obviously, you can do this if you have an ESX cluster uh, in your organization. Mm -hmm. That's totally doable. Or your basement, if you got a got a box in your basement and you go to... Uh, or your basement, yeah. The VMUG Advantage program, 200 bucks a year, and you can get... Uh, you can get a, a, an annual license that will run uh, vSphere and, uh, uh, yeah, run all that stuff for you. They're pretty uh, cheap. Though, if you have an Intel beast in your basement, I will just run Ubuntu natively. Just do bare metal and why not? Yeah, if you want to dedicate yeah. that, uh, that box to that. Uh, or only... dual boot or something. Yeah. Yeah, I've got an ancient dual proc workstation, uh, some HP Z80 that's probably 10 or something years old with 128 gig of RAM in it. If I put Ubuntu natively on it, it would probably run great. Uh, let me tell you one secret of IT. Whenever you try to repurpose old stuff, you waste more time that, than that old stuff is worth. Uh, it depends. It depends on what it is. I've had good luck with this box because it's well supported uh, on HCLs and so on. Um, but, mm -hmm. I, but I know what you're saying. Yes. I mean, it has an old CPU. iOS XR will boot in 20 minutes. Oh, not good for that specific use case. It depends on what you're modeling, as always. It yeah, depends, right? exactly. That's what you're trying yeah. to get done. But um, that thing's also an electricity hog. Shut that thing off and you know, it was costing me 35 bucks a month to run it just to power it. And my electricity here is relatively inexpensive. So, yeah, I mean, I'm looking more at doing things like this in the cloud somewhere as more, it's just going to be yeah. cheaper and more uh, Absolutely, more uh, particularly if you're using containers. Greetings, podcast listener. If you'd like a simple way to stay on top of the flood of IT news, new products, and tech trends, check out Network Break from the Packet Pushers. Every week we strip out the marketing speak from product launches, press releases, and executive pronouncements to figure out what's really going on. Our twin goals are to keep you informed and not waste your time. As one listener said, I get to hear about news that I otherwise would have missed. It's like pressing the easy button. So press the easy button for yourself by listening to Network Break at PacketPushers.net or on your favorite podcatcher. All right, so we've gotten our platform set up, whatever we've chosen. We've got NetLab installed. All the components are installed. And then you said, and now there's the interesting part, the images. All right, talk to us about yeah. that. Yeah. So there are vendors who get it. It's NVIDIA and it's Nokia. Period. NVIDIA as in uh, Cumulus specifically. Cumulus Linux, yeah. Right. So those two are available as containers on Docker Hub and you just specify the image name and it downloads automatically and it's up and running in no time. Mm -hmm. Then you have vendors who almost got it. This is Arista with uh, their uh, EOS container. Right. You download it uh, while well, you have to register. Then you uh, have to install the container, which is trivial. 
It's all documented in NetLab documentation and it's up and running. It all works. Virtual machines are a disaster because whenever you get a vendor image, it boots into some auto setup thingy <laughs> and it expects you to connect to the serial port, which is emulated through a telnet session. And uh, sometimes you need the VGA menu to navigate through. And how are you going to automate that? Yeah. So for uh, everything else, you have to build so-called vagrant box. You spin up the VM from the uh, QCO or ISO image that the vendor provides. Uh, then you have to uh, go through the initial configuration, kill the auto setup process and all that crap, paste some configuration into the virtual machine so that the next time it boots, it will do DHCP on the management interface and a few saying other things like having the default passwords. Then you save the configuration, which actually writes it to the disk. Mm -hmm. Then you kill the virtual machine, and then the magic happens, and Vagrant uh, takes that modified disk image and packages that as the startup image for the new virtual machines. Mm -hmm. And when you then start the Vagrant box, you get a semi-configured device with the default passwords and DHCP on the management interface, and we can work with that. But that, that's a one-time prep thing that I'm doing as I'm Absolutely. preparing my NetLab my, my platform. I'm basically pre prepping the image, turning it into a Vagrant box using that process yeah. you just described. Now, NetLab can use that newly created Vagrant box uh, with appropriate defaults so that configuration can be automated. Yeah, and it's all documented. So for every device that uh, NetLab supports, we try to build a installation script, which still requires your cooperation because we are not going to, you know, try to figure out how to stop the auto install process on some weird device. So it starts the virtual machine. It connects you to the serial port or to the VGA screen. And then uh, it gives you a recipe. Oh, kill this, do that, do that, do conf t, copy paste this stuff. When you're done, do right, and then kill the virtual machine and we'll do the rest. But we, we won't waste time fully automating that because as you said, it's a one-off process. You do it once and then you're done. And dealing with expect scripts is such a waste of time. <laughs> Now, there's one other wild card here that I noticed in your documentation that I can use NetLab with a hardware lab. Like, I took that to mean I've got a bunch of uh, Cisco gear sitting in a rack downstairs. I could power that up and aim NetLab at it to configure it for me? Yes, exactly. So, obviously, you have to create the lab topology in YAML file that reflects your physical setup. And you will have to define the interface names because we can't guess them. But, but from there, once you have the physical wiring described in a lab topology, you can do anything you can do with NetLab. Hmm. From addressing to routing protocol to whatever else, and it will generate the configurations. And uh, hopefully you got the management IP addresses and the usernames and the passwords right. <laughs> and if you did, it will push the configurations to your devices. There's one other trick you can use. There are hooks in NetLab that allow you to connect your virtual network to the physical network. You can connect a device straight to your Ethernet interface, mm -hmm. or you can connect a segment, a Linux bridge, to uh, an interface. So I could add so, virtual images, if you will, that are running on the server to my physical devices if I want, have them interact? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can say, well, in my lab, I have these extra devices that are unmanaged. So NetLab will not touch them, but it will consider them, for example, when setting up BGP sessions. Hmm. So obviously you have to pre-configure your physical gear, hmm. but then on your virtual machines, you will get a BGP session to the physical gear. 
Does that also mean I'd have a way to connect my NetLab to the internet? Of course. Well, the there would be the question of originating the default route mm -hmm. because uh, someone would have to do that. But yeah, other than that, well, the management network. So let's put it this way. Most devices are configured so that the management interface is in a VRF. Mm -hmm. That's our uh, recommended uh, initial device configuration. And because the management interface gets the, its IP address via DHCP, it usually also gets the default route from libvirt DHCP server, which means that the management interface of every device can theoretically, if you allow it, reach the internet, mm -hmm. which uh, is really useful if you're running Linux nodes in your lab and you want to download some extra software. Yeah, uh, that's actually one of, another question that I had. Can I have an endpoint like some little Linux host that yeah. I want to use as an endpoint yeah. for some testing? Yeah, I can yeah. do that. Well, it's uh, way better than that. Uh, so yes, you can have Linux virtual machines. You can also have Linux containers. Oh, okay. So instead of full-blown Linux virtual machine that might eat two gigabytes of RAM, you just start an Alpine or BusyBox uh, Linux container that contains, you know, the ping, the trace route, the basic stuff. It gets configured with static routes pointing to the adjacent uh, router. And then you can use those Linux containers, which cost you maybe 50 meg of RAM as the endpoints to do pings and all that. Uh, now, if you're using uh, Linux, there's this nice feature in the latest release called validate where you can execute commands on Linux or what well, actually on any device, but I usually use Linux or FRR or Cumulus and you can do pings and then you validate whether the pings succeed. So you build up your lab and then you run a validation script and it runs a series of tests you defined and it tells you, well, the lab is working or no, the lab is broke. <laughs> You've been having funny fun, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, and it's all color coded. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question for those folks who maybe don't have a relationship with a vendor where they can download a bunch of images. It's too hard for them to get them, as you talked about a lot of these challenges. Uh, what, what, what if I wanted to use FRR, uh, free, free range routing? as well, a, a free tool that gives me all kinds of routing and capability. Is that good enough for if I'm trying to basically learn networking? Well, FRR and Cumulus Linux have this weird approach to configuration where you configure some stuff using Linux tools and you configure some stuff using the CLI that is called industry standard CLI if you don't want to be sued by Cisco. Right. Uh, and, uh, so if you are okay with uh, either NetLab configuring the interfaces for you, or you doing a lot of Linux stuff, uh, like changing Etsy network interfaces file, mm -hmm. uh, then yes, FRR is a perfect choice. If you are just interested in a routing protocol, then FRR is exactly the right choice. For example, when I'm creating the BGP labs, which is like an application running on top of what we just discussed now, uh, I'm always uh, trying things out with uh, FRR and Cumulus Linux and Arista because these three boot up fast enough that I don't get bored. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you can use anything else you wish, but then, you know, you will have plenty of time to make sandwiches. <laughs> yes. So what, uh, okay, so FRR would work for, for a lot of folks in certain situations. Um, yeah, absolutely. Some... Uh, also, Arista's uh, both container and VM are downloadable without the support contract. You just have to register. Mm -hmm. iOS, uh, no, sorry, Nexus OS is downloadable just with an account so you have to register you don't need a support contract and juniper vptx is downloadable with zero hassle they even allow you to copy the url so that you can go to the server and download with curl 
Okay, the VPTX one is new to me. Um, the last time I checked in this was about a year ago, and there was nothing. They going on. launched it in summer, and the November release is actually usable. Okay, good to know. And then there is Nokia SR Linux, which mm-hmm. is also freely downloadable. Are there other notable platforms supported by NetLab that we should mention? Oh, uh, ASA, iOS V, iOS XE, Nexus OS, XR, uh, VMX, VPTX, uh, VQFX, uh, Arista, Aruba, Fortinet, uh, Nokia SR Linux, Nokia SR OS, uh, Vios, Dell OS X, Microtic 6, Microtic 7. Mm-hmm. I probably forgot like three. That's okay. That's a pretty, pretty full featured amount of support. Uh, I didn't hear F5. So no F5, A10. No, No. none of those. Okay. Yeah. If someone wants to have them, they're more than welcome to implement the configuration templates and submit, submit a pull request. Okay. Well, okay. So you've mentioned this several times. People can mention, uh, can uh, submit a pull request and so on. So NetLab is a community project. It's up on GitHub. Um, talk about how the community participates in the project. You mentioned pull requests and so on. You mentioned plugins. What all kind of support have you been getting from the community? What are you looking for from the community to support NetLab? Well, uh, anyone who does anything is most welcome. Even if you just fix a typo, thank you. That's the easiest pull request you can make in your life. You fix some documentation, you submit that. I say, thank you. We move on. A bunch of people are writing templates for uh, different devices. So there is a guy from Nokia who does all the SR Linux and the SROS stuff. There is an Italian guy who was working for a system integrator. Now I think they were acquired by someone. Anyway, he's doing all the weird stuff like Vios, uh, OS X, Aruba, Microtic, uh, I'm doing uh, what I'm interested in, which would be iOS V, which usually spills over to iOS XE, Mm -hmm. Uh, Arista, Cumulus, FRR. So there are like three or four of us who regularly write stuff. But whoever is interested in getting, I don't know, a better support for their beloved device, they can just start working on stuff and uh, create the configuration templates for their particular device. And now that we have so many devices already implemented, it's usually just a question of looking at something that is similar to what you have and uh, just doing you know, copy-paste with a few tweaks here and there and you're done. So I know that the Aruba stuff was a copy of uh, something else with the tweaks where the Aruba syntax deviates from the industry standard CLI. (laughs) Uh, Usually the biggest problem is uh, getting a new device in and building the box. Once you are past that hurdle, once you have the, bo- the, the Vagrant box built and the device up and running, it's pretty smooth sailing from there on. Just take existing templates, you look at them, you figure out what they're doing. And when you're doing this for the third time, it's really quick. <laughs> of course. <laughs> then plugins are a little bit more convoluted because they involve Python code. You have to understand some of the internals. But, you know, if you come along saying, well, I have this great idea and I think we should be doing this and that, then, yeah, absolutely. Either I will tell you to write a plugin to do it, or I might just take the idea and run with it and implement it in the core net lab. Like uh, just a few days ago, someone opened a wonderful discussion saying, well, I think we need to support a four byte ASN and I think the code needs to be fixed here and here and here. I was like, wow, thank you. Let me do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's look ahead. What is on the roadmap for NetLab? Well, there is no long-term roadmap because we're not enterprise ready. <laughs> we are continuously adding new bits and pieces. So the core is pretty stable. And I don't think that the core will expand too much unless someone has a great idea. I don't have it at the moment. 
So right now there are tiny things that I'm working on, like this four byte BGP AS number will be there. We will have to deal with all the crazy BGP propagation of BGP communities because, you know, you have the two byte ASM BGP communities and the four byte ASM BGP communities and they're configured in the same different ways on different devices. Yeah, you don't want to know. Then uh, the DHCP module will come. There are examples, and I was using NetLab when I was writing that overly long how DHCP really works series, but it was all custom attributes and custom configs, and now that will turn into a regular module. And then the like the bigger thing I'm working on is a support for routing demons. You know, things like go BGP and bird <sighs> and open BGP daemon and whatever else. And then you have the DHCP servers running on Linux and uh, the DNS server running on Linux. And you mentioned NTP. Why not? So uh, there will be a generic framework that will allow you to run some service on a Linux node. Mm-hmm. And it will be either a container or a VM. With the container, obviously, you will have to build the image. And I already have that part working. It works like a charm because Docker, you know, you just say Docker build and bam, magic happens and it works. And uh, with VMs, we'll probably just install software as you start the VM. And if you want to build, you know, a custom image where that software is pre-installed so you don't wait 30 seconds every time you start the VM, you can do that. Now, we've talked about NetLab for not not quite an hour, but we're getting there. And there's yet another project that we wanted to talk about. I guess we'll have to talk about it briefly. That is BGP Labs, which is is closely related to NetLab. Can you talk about BGP Labs? Give us the give us the elevator pitch. Well, you always wanted to learn BGP, but you don't know where to start and the labs are so hard to set up and you would like to try out individual features and all the Things that you get out there, you know, are like eight hours long. Well, BGP Labs is a solution for you. Effectively, it's an application running on top of uh, NetLab. So you get the NetLab topology files and you get the lab descriptions on a website or in source code. If you want to look at them, it's all on GitHub. Then you choose what you want to practice. It starts with, let's configure one eBGP session. Mm -hmm. Now let's configure two eBGP sessions. Now let's originate a network. Mm -hmm. Now uh, let's uh, build a bigger network and redistribute our SPF into BGP. Oh, now let's configure IPv6. So right now there are close to 20 labs going through individual BGP features. And I'm slowly adding, now that I have the baseline infrastructure in place, I'm adding the challenge labs where I will not tell you what to do. I will just tell you what you have to have at the end. Like, uh, oh, the one that uh, tripped some people. I have two enterprise networks using different BGP AS numbers. Now I want to merge them into one network, but I can only touch the two routers that are connected to the interconnecting link. Hmm, okay. And I want that to look as one AS number from the outside because both of my providers have AS path filters in place and I cannot use the two AS numbers in the AS path. Hmm, some kind of a VRF or I don't know, something. Uh, lo- lo- uh, let's not spoil the fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, anyway, you get the instructions. They are uh, on purpose a little bit vague. So they tell you what you might have to do, but not how to do it. Because I still believe that if you give people typing recipes, you turn them into monkeys, not networking engineers. And uh, then you can decide to use whatever device you wish. So you want to practice uh, BGP on Aruba? Be my guest. Just talk to Aruba's account team to get the image and all that. You want to practice BGP on Junos? Well, download VPTX and play with it. The external routers are usually FRR or Cumulus Linux. Uh, Sometimes I even support Arista EOS or Cisco IOS V. Because, you know, you need some BGP feeds. So you set up your environment and then you just go through the labs and you slowly master individual 
BGP features. Uh, you said it's an application, so I don't have to download NetLab and then do something else. I download BGP. Oh, yeah, you have to set package, up the or? whole NetLab environment. Oh, okay, I do, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and then you just uh, clone this Git repo, and you get the topology files and all the device configs that you need and all of that. I gotcha, I gotcha. Do you have other projects like BGP Labs in mind? Well, yeah, um, probably, well, definitely EVPN. Mm -hmm. I'll probably start with VXLAN and all the crazy VXLAN stuff like probably won't go for uh, multicast because I hate it, but <laughs> you know, all the other stuff and then VLANs and VRFs and symmetrical IRB and asymmetrical IRB and all that, just so that people master the data plane. And then uh, I will add EVPN to that. And once I get that done, uh, oh, SRM PLS maybe? Why not? I'm thinking about OSPF and ISIS and MPLS and MPLS VPN, but honestly, I don't know. There are old technologies. Is anyone still interested in them? It's, yeah, boy, we could have a long conversation about just that too, because it's it's less about that. That's like your foundation of a network. That's your underlay. And now there's other things riding on top of uh, a lot of those, not everything you said, but a lot of what you just said. And that's where all the interesting stuff seems to be heading in a more proprietary way, but you still got to have a handle on all of the the basics of what's going on underneath because that's yeah. actually networking. That's what's going on. But, but I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I, I struggle with you with that question. Yeah. But you know, the reason I started with BGP is because it's like the kitchen sink of networking these days. Yes, it is. Even if you want to connect to the public cloud with a VPN, you have to run BGP with it. Yep. Well, Yvonne, this has been a great conversation. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're giving all this away. NetLab is free and open source, right? Yes. Uh, BGP yes. Labs is the same. Those exercises exactly. are all free yeah. and open source. Okay. Are you just bored in retirement, Yvonne? Is that what's going on here that you're just doing these projects for fun? Well, I'll call it karma points, but yes. <laughs> okay. So let me see if I get your URLs right. So first of all, ipspace.net. That's that's all things uh, uh, Yvonne are there. Start there, yes. Yeah, start there. Okay. NetLab, netlab.tools. That's uh, that's it. A good place there. And that'll, you can, you'll find the GitHub repo and all the rest. Yep. Yeah, there's the documentation and then you start exploring. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, uh, for that one, you don't even need to touch the Git repo because it's packaged as a Python package. Right. I remember reading the, reading the blog article, you explained how you figured that out and got made it very yeah. easy to install from there. Yeah. yeah. So just download the Python pack, pip3, install uh, Network Lab, because someone took NetLab like two weeks before I wanted to do that. <laughs> of course they did. So, yeah. <laughs> And then uh, bgplabs.net is where exactly. I can clone yeah. all the other the, the BGP exercises yeah. and so on. For the well, BGP that's Lab. where you get the uh, instructions. Effectively, it's uh, all written in Markdown, and then uh, I'm using MKDocs and push it to Cloudflare probably. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you're on LinkedIn. Are you anywhere else on social media these days, Yvonne, worth pointing out? Uh, well, I am still on Twitter. I admit to my sins. <laughs> <laughs> You're but not now, the only one. Uh, some other people. I haven't looked at it very much unless someone mentions yeah, me. Yeah, no. I, 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 I'm in read-only mode, and I'm very selective at what I read. Yeah. So LinkedIn is probably the best way to get in touch with me. Very good. Very good. Again, ipspace.net netlab.tools and bgplabs.net to reference everything that uh, Yvonne and I talked about today. And thanks to you for listening all the way to the end. I have been Ethan Banks, your co-host for today. Actually, your host today. I was solo on the, on this particular show. You can follow or connect with me on LinkedIn if you would like to. And uh, follow the Packet Pushers at packetpushers.net. Brandy new website, all very shiny and new if you haven't been up there for a while. A lot of new shows that we're putting out and so on these days. A lot more than just the heavy networking podcast you're listening to right now. We've got a blog with engineering and industry analysis articles, several other nerdy IT podcasts for engineers, and then our human infrastructure and packet capture newsletters, along with our community Slack channel where you could DM me if you wanted. I would respond to you there. And again, all of those resources are free, ungated, meaning that we're not asking you to log into the web so we can track you because that would, that would suck. We just offer information for your professional career development. Last but not least, 
Remember that too much networking would never be enough.